the Stone Center does, and we've been fortunate to have this partnership with the bookstore for about the past uh, 10 years. Uh, actually, uh, this year marks the first time we've been in this particular space, so we're happy that um, we're able to come here because this is much more roomy than it was downstairs when we were a little bit more crowded. I used to say we were more intimate, but in, in any case, this gives you a little bit more room to spread out. Um, we're very fortunate today because uh, not only do we have a distinguished professor, we have a very, very good friend of the Stone Center and a very good friend to many of these students, some who may have traveled with him uh, on international study trips to South Africa and may have known about his work in the Horn and other parts of the continent. Professor Verikit Hadji Selassie is America's Distinguished Professor of African Studies and Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I never know whether you say Distinguished Emeritus Professor or Emeritus Distinguished Professor. Either way, you know he's done great things, whichever way that I say it. He is a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences from 1994 to 97. He served as chairman of the Part of the Constitution Commission of Eritrea. And he also served as Ethiopia's Attorney General and Emperor Haile Selassie's government, as well as Associate Justice of the Federal Supreme Court. He is the author of a number of books. Um, this is one of those very expansive intellects who writes not only on politics and government, he's written poetry, he's also written novels, he is a true Renaissance man in the, in, in, in the way that we used to think of Renaissance man, a man of letters and also a very, very gentle soul. He was the Lutenberg Professor in African Studies and Professor Lutenberg, will you wave your hand so folks know that he endowed that professorship <laughs> for that, that great work to be able to go on. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the, the most important work that Professor Selassie did was to serve as my major professor when I was in graduate school in Washington, D.C., and to crack the whip uh, on me and to keep me in order. So um, in that light, we're going to ask him to come up. He's going to talk a little bit about the book and uh, maybe read from the text, I think, and then we'll have an opportunity to engage. So those folks that are in the back, we have a number of plenty of seats. Please come up before he starts and you can get seated. Okay, you can come right in here on this side and then it's easier. here. And it's up here. Mentor, my illustrious mentor, 
uh, Dr. William Luttenberg, uh, in whose name my uh, endowed chair is uh, named. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to be one of your mentee. Is there such a word as mentee? <laughs> a personal mentor? Uh, but uh, above all, I value our friendship. One of my favorite people at ENC is by the, a man by the name of uh, Robert Porter. Not Bob, uh, Robert Porter. Uh, I saw him the other day and he said, you look even younger than the last time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of kind word that gives me younger, Robert. Uh, but uh, if there's any reason, in addition to uh, the man above, uh, why I keep young and energetic, it is my delightful, wonderful wife, who could not wake today if she had the phone. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, there's a number of Eritreans and Ethiopians here who know uh, Winter, my wife, and I'm sure they're disappointed. Uh, my friend also say, you, 10 months ago, you, you uh, published a book, and how come? I said, no, this is only just uh, a compilation of uh, lectures I've given, put them together a little here and there, so I'm not as, as, as energetic as a thing. I wish I were. But uh, I hope that uh, uh, some of you will have a chance to, to read it. Uh, it's titled, you may have been intrigued by the title, Words That Govern. It comes from a remark by a 19th century British Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who famously said, it is with words that we govern. Uh, and I adopted that uh, phrase uh, for uh, a chapter in my book, uh, the second chapter, and also as a title uh, for the book, because uh, originally I had actually thought of using uh, the title of chapter four of the book, Crime and Punishment in America which is an area uh, of recent, uh, uh, my research interest, research interest recently, I think in two, three years, beginning with the Trayvon Martin event. Uh, how many of you remember that event, Trayvon Martin? Almost all of you. It was a signal event in my life, because I decided to focus on this most important issue of crime and punishment in, uh, in America. And uh, I've actually have decided to expand it, the chapter into a book. My publisher, however, persuaded me that chapter doesn't reflect the themes, the general themes of the book. Uh, if I may read the titles of the book, give an idea of what it is about. First chapter is Democracy and Peace in the Age of Globalization. Old problems, new challenges for Africa. Chapter two, words that govern aspects of language, law, and politics. Three, between two worlds, making sense of national boundaries. This is, for the audience, so this is the Pan-Africanist among my, my friends. Uh, I have been intrigued uh, by the uh, problems emanating from the fact that we are now a continent uh, of nations that have been defined by colonially fixed boundaries with all the historical puzzles that that carries. But above all, there have been problems within Africa and between African countries. And I thought that a review of this issue, a discussion of the issue of uh, the boundaries, uh, with the title Between Two Worlds. I thought that would be a challenge enough. Uh, I hope to read a few uh, <coughs> sections from this book. And one of the ones I'm going to read I mean, actually the closing section of, of uh, uh, chapter three, Between Two Worlds. Uh, and that represents my like, Africanist uh, uh, view. I am from Eritrea, my homeland is Eritrea. I also lived and worked in Ethiopia. There's a larger sense in which we are all Ethiopians. 
uh, uh, but above all, we are Africans. And those of us who had a kind of romance with Africa during the era of liberation saw a bright star rising in the international horizon. Africa, we saw, was going to, to, to be great. <coughs> There's still hope for the Africa with what is going on in Congo, what is going on in South Sudan, what is going on in parts of Africa here and there. We should not diminish our hopes. Uh, I asked my friend and colleague, very good friend, uh, George Njongola, earlier on, how are things in Congo? He just shook his head. <laughs> exactly. With all that, I don't, uh, I, I don't lose hope. And I think that for Africans' ideal of going beyond the, the borders, using ideas and purposes transcending all the uh, differences that we have, is the hope in Africa. And a young friend of mine who read the book, this new book, said, I can't just imagine it being a Pan-African, so an Eritrean, for heaven's sake. We have a nation. Why do you want to go beyond that nation and think as an African? I said, precisely because I'm Pan-Africans, precisely to precisely because I'm Pan-Africans that I fought for Eritrean independence. Because charity begins at home. A good Pan-Africans must be a good Congolese, a good Kenyan, a good Eritrean. Uh, and what that means is that in each nation in Africa today, the, the, the leaders and the people must live by certain core values. Among those core values, of course, is peace, democracy, human rights, rule of law, and uh, social justice. Now, why did I begin with uh, the first chapter, Democracy and Peace in the Age of Globalization? Uh, the context of globalization, but the issues I have uh, taken up in this chapter are precisely the lot of democracy and peace in this age of globalization. Has democracy been diminished? Has peace disappeared? Are we uh, living in an era of war? I think not. With all the problems that it entails, democracy as the paramount political value of our age, of our epoch, is here to stay, as is globalization. I just uh, wrote a short, a brief uh, note on what that means. Those of you who've written, who read the first part, may be intrigued. It's a very, you may, you may already be uh, uh, having mental indigestion reading this very uh, convoluted uh, phrases, four of them. Uh, but uh, no matter, read the last part. It says pros and cons. To some, that is, globalization is, it is the salvation of humanity, holding the key to universal prosperity and peace. It is credited with the opening of borders, free movement of capital, people and goods and services. Others fault it as a source of the major problems of our time, as a disruptive force, exacerbating people's problems, causing environmental devastation, destroying native cultures, and widening the gap between rich and poor, uh, both uh, at the national level and globally. Now, if you read the, 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 the following note, it summarizes what is in those convoluted four points. Namely, globalization is the product of a long historical process, spurred by the human urge to acquire more knowledge of what lies beyond the known boundary, as well as by the will to expand and acquire more resources. Driven by the powerful economies of the world, it is essentially concerned with the expansion of global commerce and culture. That's it. So, how has peace, how peace and, and, and democracy fared in this context? First of all, what do we mean by peace? And what do we mean by democracy? The peace <coughs> throughout human history has been a wonderful, uh, 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 valued, a much valued uh, thing. Indeed, in some languages, uh, you greet people with peace. In Arabic, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. 
in uh, Hebrew, Shalom, peace be with you. Those of you who are uh, Christians know that at the, at the end of the, of the Mass, they are told by the uh, pastor, go in peace, or peace be with you. So peace is a wonderful thing, because those of us who have lived in areas of conflict uh, know exactly why peace is valued. It takes, it takes I think, uh, an experience of that kind to value peace that much. Uh, without peace, there would be no prosperity, there would be no activity that are creative. And therefore, peace is the most important context for human development and for human interaction. Um, may I read the summary that the editors of, my, of the chapter of my book uh, wonderfully uh, gave for this chapter. It will, it will save me a lot of time. They wrote the abstract. This article, which is usually an article which appeared in the African uh, Review, this article considers the impact of globalization on peace and democracy, especially in Africa. Peace is essential for ordered life, and democracy is the paramount political value of our epoch. Are democracy and globalization compatible? They can be under certain conditions. Can globalization guarantee peace? Yes, if it can help in addressing the problems of poverty. <coughs> the the Constitutive Act of the African Union enjoins African leaders to promote and protect human and people's rights and to consolidate democratic institutions and culture. It also requires the promotion of peace, security, and stability in the continent. The conclusion, globalization must be controlled and the global institutions must be democratized. That's the condition uh, that uh, is sum sum summarized in my, 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 uh, my discussion in this chapter. But then there is uh, uh, words that govern my second the third chapter. Why? Why did I use that? Well, ever since my childhood, I've been fascinated with language. When the Italians, uh, the Italians occupied Eritrea long before I was born, but I, I was born in an area where Eritreans spoke their own language, and they were Italian speaking language. So I grew up fairly hearing this uh, language. So much so that actually I speak Italian with, without an accent. After Italians, I speak to Neapolitan accent, Napoli. Because the, the Napolitans were the, the majority who came to colonize Africa. So I speak with, 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 with a Napolitan accent. I can even imitate them and fool them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> such was my interest in language that. Um, I started learning Italian and later French and Arabic. English, of course, I, have, I could have avoided. And then, of course, there was the, was the mother tongue, Tegrinya, and Amharic. It's a sister language of Ethiopia. So it is not because they're a polyglot, but because they're deeply interested, fascinated by language. So that is one reason why I wrote this, uh, this, this chapter. I, I presented in a, a conference on languages which was convened uh, and held in Asmara, Eritrea, in 2000, January 2000. So this is the oldest, the, the, the oldest chapter uh, on language. Now, why, why language law in politics? Well, uh, a famous uh, academic, legal academic, by the name of uh, uh, Aurel, a senior moment sometimes, I mean, all of us. The name can we come back in there. Uh, David Melikoff. David Melikoff. A wonderful uh, uh, professor of law and a great man. Who also at sometimes uh, uh, pleaded for the actors uh, in that uh, crazy place called Hollywood. So he had, he had that background and then decided to, to teach law. And he wrote, Several books. One, the language of the law. Uh, I happened to spend a year at UCLA Law School as a fellow, and we became friends. And that is one also one reason why I am fascinated with the language of the law. Now, what about politics? Well, one of my favorite uh, prosaic definitions of politics 
uh, is who gets what, when, and how. Very simple. That's politics. What about language? Is the uh, prosaic definition of language of the of law? Another <coughs> friend of mine, recently deceased, said he was a philosopher and also law lawyer and a musician. But he was Mark Raskin. He said law is the frozen politics of yesterday. Because before it became law, it was a scientific article, argument, heated argument in the vestibules of the Congress or the Parliament. And in the end, there was agreement and it became law. So, the frozen politics of yesterday. You see that relationship between law, language, and politics, uh, and, and my fascination with it. I don't think I, I have time to say more about that. So, on to the third chapter, my uh, Pan African uh, chapter. I hope the uh, member of the audience, one of Africans, will bear with me because it, it's rather lengthy. It is the, the concluding chapter of uh, completing com uh, the, completing, uh, the uh, part of the, of the chapter. It's based on a speech I gave when I awarded, or I awarded the Mu'alimu Irere Fellowship uh, and gave uh, a lecture, a third lecture. I said, in conclusion, I would urge the leaders of, to go beyond theoretical declaration and act more vigorously, insisting that our government do the following. Uh, sorry. There is another paragraph before it. Uh, I made a cautionary remark, that, and, I, and, and, I, and I do now. If ownership of the shared values means applying them in practice in each one of the member states, we would indeed be beholding the arrival of the reign of justice. That's okay. But, and here I, I uh, require the leaders to abide by the rule, by the rule of law, ordained by their respective constitutions and laws, two, to create regional trade groupings or where they exist reinforcing them, three, to create mechanisms of enforcement to hold errant leaders to account for their acts and omissions, four, to encourage the independence of the judiciary in each of its member nations, five, encourage the development of strong professional associations especially related to laws and free press. Encourage the development of civil society, organizations, and finally, encourage the creation of an enabling environment to tap the increasing African expertise in all technical fields related to trade and commerce, culture, and other areas. Of the nine chapters uh, of this book, three chapters are related to issues concerning Eritrea, uh, politics, the politics of uh, division, uh, the absence of democracy, the absence of accountability, and, and uh, uh, all that kind of thing which is necessary for, for governance. Uh, chapter 7 is titled uh, For Greater Unity, and uh, Chapter 8 is about the failure of leadership. It's titled from, it's titled, when the protector becomes predator, the critical challenge facing Eritrea today. And finally, uh, religion and nationalism in Eritrea's politics. The other chapters are concerned with the themes I've just outlined, tried to outline. Crime and punishment in America, the elusive treasure, human rights and humanitarian law, a focus on the Horn of Africa. Self determination, the adventures of an idea and its impact on national and international politics. Uh, these are the chapters with 
themes that are united in some form or other. I try to, 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 to tie them together. Uh, I hope that you'll have time. First of all, I hope, I hope that you'll buy the book. <laughs> yeah, America has taught me a thing or two about uh, sales machine. <laughs> so why not? <laughs> buy the book. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope we'll have time for some questions and answers. Thank you. chapter on the Trayvon Martin that you talked about? Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I have not read it yet, but I'm just kind of curious. Private punishment in America. It is obviously the most intriguing chapter. Certainly it is, in my view, uh, the most critical problem. America is facing and will continue to be facing unless and until this issue is resolved. Uh, and until and unless, unless and until institutional racism is faced uh, fair and square uh, and uh, we resolve this legacy of what I call the original sin of America, slavery. And they will be, this problem will be with us. I discuss the problem of mass incarceration, mostly uh, young black men and brown men, increasing in number. Uh, I have statistics on them. And I, I, I will discuss the prison. What is it for? Is it just uh, to punish? or it rehabilitate? What is the, the philosophy of the policymakers of the United States in this respect? And what is the policy philosophy of scholars, scholars and practitioners of the United States? <coughs> so it's, it's a chapter which is a challenge. Um, it is really the outline for a book. Uh, it is something which I can a lot help. My meager shoulders cannot carry such a heavy burden. It will need at least two scholars, uh, or three. One uh, steeped in the idea of criminal law, scholars, philosophy, and so on. Another uh, political scientist, and another historian. Three. So I may be calling on some of you, you young, bright students. Uh, or you young professors. I have already identified one young bright student. I would embarrass her by talking to her. But I need another one. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you can democratize globalization. I don't. I, for something that inherently preys on inequality between nations and almost bases the way that it moves on inequality between nations, particularly inequalities of power, inequalities of infrastructure. How can you possibly how can you possibly counter China's sensibility about globalization, the United States sensibilities about globalization? European nations, with what you see happening in the South, where ideas about humanism tend to guide the way that people understand themselves in the world, and kind of materialistic, mechanical notions of, of how one is supposed to uh, send ideas, capital 
and any other kinds of, of good service around the world. How can you possibly democratize something that's inherently un unfair? I mean, this question, which is a very good question, uh, has been in the minds of humanity for at least 300 years. Uh, when he asked this question, he was also asked, what is democracy? How has it come about? Why do we value so much? It's really a recent origin, 200 years ago, of course. Uh, it is built on the ruins of feudalism. In feudalism, there was no such thing as equality. There was no such thing as human rights. People uh, were tied to the land, and they served at the will of the owner of the land, and the Lord. And uh, people shed their, their blood to bring about democracy. Uh, organizations, movements, human movements throughout the world, Europe, Africa, Asia, have gone into the making of democracy. So to answer your question, I have to go uh, on about way. What's democracy? Well, democracy uh, is the idea of people being equal, recognizing each other as subjects of rights. And uh, uh, if it is so valuable, they have to fight for it. They just have to fight for it. Africans have fought for their independence. But African people are still now fighting their governments for equal rights, for self-determination, for human rights. Uh, by the same token also, I think that there have to be an international uh, uh, movement that makes the, the realization and the promotion and protection of democracy as its idea. It is universal. It's universal. It doesn't know any color. Uh, I, am, uh, I believe in this wholeheartedly. You cannot own it only as an African or European or African or American. Only some people tend to do that. It has to be fought. It's a universal idea. Uh, I remember when uh, the Chinese uh, leader, President uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, was president, came to visit the United States. And at that time, there were some religious movement called the Falun Gong, and they had arrested many of them. And President uh, Clinton asked, President Jiang Zemin, uh, you are violating the fundamental human right, the right to free exercise uh, of religion. <laughs> and Jiang Zemin smiled and said, human rights, that's uh, a Western idea. So Clinton, who was never lost for words, actually at that time was lost for words, <laughs> he said, in that case, you are, you are on the wrong side of history, which is a good answer, actually. You are on the wrong side of history. His successor, I forget the name, successor of uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, to the same problem said, well, we are getting there. We need time, we are getting there. Unfortunately, they are going back. Right now, President uh, Xi has insisted <coughs> that there should be in the constitution of, the, of, 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 of uh, China an article which says Xi Jinping thought, like Mao Zedong thought, that the ideology of this man in Uyghur is going to be inscribed in the preamble of the constitution of China. In other words, there will be no firm limit. It's going to be an end of the life. So China has gone backwards. China has gone backwards. I don't know how the youth in China, those who showed us a wonderful event in Tiananmen Tain 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 Square, Tiananmen Square, where they are, where the professionals, the lawyers, the journalists, the professors are in this. I'm sure they're totally against it. And yet, I think it's going to happen. We are going to have an interesting time, as the Chinese say. Yes. Could I add to that? Uh, sure. The, no, to ask a question. Uh, as someone who has had a lot of experience in politics for the last six or seven years, what do you think of the trend? Is the trend today is the world of authoritarianism? If you still, for example, of uh, uh, Xi Jinping, 
having uh, the elder ones, the uh, Hungarian guy, the Nagoris European leaders, uh, who saying that uh, while we in Africa are fighting for term limits for democracy, our parts of the world, leaders are moving toward authoritarianism. Uh, is that the, the trend? And how can this trend start? It seems to be a trend, but it's a, it's a trend which will beget a counter trend. It is simply not human nature to accept submission to authority, to one man rule, when there has been an extraordinary history, 50, 100 years, 150 years, in which humankind fought for freedom, for human rights. You know, and so it, is, it seems to be a trend. And certainly, uh, the authoritarian leaders in Africa must be having a tea party, wonderful party. Uh, certainly, uh, the man who occupies the White House right here, I don't want to mention his name, is having a uh, wonderful time, saying, well, if the Chinese are going to be ruled by, by one man, then why not us? Which means that democracy is under attack here too, in the United States. Democracy is certainly under attack in the United States. And sometimes I wonder whether we're aware of this. I am a return by birth by an American, and I have also my right to speak about this boldly. We cannot, we can't relinquish, relinquish this fundamental right, this wonderful thing called democracy. We can't. So, yes, it's going to be quite a fight. It's going to be quite a fight. Yes, go ahead. So, given your interest, background, scholarship, Interest, interest in language, in politics. I'd like to make a comment and a comment on that. It seems to me in this country that the right gets to name everything. Chain migration. And I want to scream, no, you mean family reunification. Voter ID. And I want to holler at them as loud as I can. No, you mean voter suppression. I think this is a really important and concerning Friend, that I can give many more examples. I would just love to hear your comment on this. Well, I have been interested in what's going on in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Florida. There's a, a youth movement afoot. It's high time. There's too much quiet in the campuses. It's high time that you, you the youth, should be arrested. And I think there's a movement now brewing because of the, of the massacre. And that's cool. Uh, well, you know how old Marx was when he wrote the Communist Manifesto? 26. How old was Jefferson when he wrote that historic document called uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence? I, I, I cannot speak about it in the presence of, uh, of my mentor. He had a wonderful uh, books on presidents. The latest is such a volume. I've started, by the way, with Bill. I, I can't finish it. I, I, I need time. Uh, but um, uh, there is a there's something which I, which I read in the Times about this uh, Hungarian man. Yeah, it's a very interesting letter. He said, as a former progressive member of the Hungarian parliament, I had a first-hand experience of how Prime Minister Viktor Orban transformed Hungary. Mr. Orban's electoral victories were a result of the disillusionment of most Hungarians felt after 20 years of democracy. Their resentment was rooted in the policies of technocratic elites who as ardent followers of the neoliberal orthodoxy, promised that Hungary would catch up with the West. But corrupt privatization, chronic unemployment, rising inequality, and crumbling schools and hospitals became the reality. So while on a superficial level, Hungary looked like a fairy tale, 
of post-communist transition, the social conditions of everyday life were severe. Now, this man was a member of Hungary. Hungary was one of the uh, showcases for democracy in the post-communist uh, era. One of the members of my advisory committee in the Constitution making affair was a member of the Constitutional Court of Hungary, who chose him because of that fact. And I went to the office way, the office way. Poland is following suit. But the people of Poland and the people of Hungary will fight it, unfortunately. We should fight for wherever we are. It's a global problem, and it requires global organization. It does. I don't know what else I can say. Rich. I'd like to follow up on uh, Professor uh, Porter's uh, question about language and the title of the book, or words uh, that uh, okay. govern and uh, the special sensibility that you bring to this political project as someone who is a novelist and a poet. There is, there is a, a passage that I've noted down in one of the essays where you wrote, with regard to poets, it has been said that they are the primal legislators of society. Their poetic insight and sensibility makes them obvious candidates for the role of healing and bringing communities together. I wonder if you comment on why you chose to put that uh, comment in the book. Because <clears throat> what is my income? And his ilk, the progressive writers, have actually created a wonderful, uh, played a wonderful role in sensitizing people towards uh, causes of liberty. He uh, fought for the liberty of uh, the Biafrans during the Biafra War. He was for freedom of the Biafrans, although he was a free of uh, a Yoruba, a different uh, a tribe. Uh, it is his poetic sensibility uh, that drove him to do that. I can also give other examples of poets and writers and artists who have actually led the way in sensitizing people. Uh, is sensitizing? The French is sensibiliser, in making people more sensitive towards problems. Uh, they cannot do it alone. Political scientists and writers of various, of various kinds. Uh, I think uh, journalists in particular, as commentators of current events, will have to uh, also uh, contribute. Uh, but my, my, my choice of that language, my, my use of that language, is to make the point that we do have, uh, poets have a, a role to play in Pan-Africanism, for instance. Uh, and uh, they have played, they have actually paid the price of having killed in the struggle in Nigeria. Congo, everywhere. Um, poets are special people. By the way, that quotation of uh, the other private legislation legislators comes from Shelley, David Shelley, British the poet. I don't know if I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Yes. 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 Yes, so I was. So, I already talked about pan Africanism last week. I was wondering what you think about the economics of it, how the organization like positive impacts and the impact of the advent of it on the current events right now. So you have to speak it slowly. I can't hear you. Yeah. I was wondering what you take on the uh, economics of pan Africanism uh, is with um, regards to the example of foreign investment uh, in Africa and how that would take a tiny part and whether that is succeeds in this experience. One of the slogans of that um, I used, and I think it's a chapter or a title of a book, is a quotation from the Bible. Seek ye the political kingdom, and all else shall be over unto ye. He thought that if Africans can put their political acts uh, right together, then the economy will take care of itself. Uh, he was not listened to 
uh, and Africa is now what it is. Africa has tremendous resources. It's one of the richest continents in the world, if not the richest continent. Congo, my friend, George, the nation, is the richest country in Africa, and the, one of the richest countries in the world, resource-wise, but it has not utilized, it has been misutilized. Unless you have a, a government that's accountable to the people, that's sensible to the needs of the people, what's the point of investment? If the, the, the first of the investment will go only to a few people, and if those few people, the leaders, just sign on, 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 the, on the line and get millions of bribes, and uh, people are uh, robbed of their right uh, to claim for the fruits of the, of the country, then they are not the leaders. That's why, in my conclusion, Mark, uh, people have to be held accountable. Leaders have to be held accountable. In Africa, there's a movement. In, I think we are in Congo, Kenya. There is a parallel parliament. Young people are organizing parallel parliaments in, in, in parallel to the official parliament, in which they actually meet and discuss, discuss openly po uh, politics, including critical uh, discussions of the leaders. This must be uh, increased. Uh, it must be, I think, advertised. It's one of those things that I speak about all the time. Uh, economics follows politics, that's my belief. It's very easy for Africans, if they actually, even regionally, they uh, pull their resources together. East Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa. That's the, the next step will be uh, a larger unity under which Africans will have, will have control of their, of, their, of their future. As it is now, the inter-countries to trade with Africa is 7% of the volume of trade. All the rest is done with, with companies in Europe, Africa, and now Asia. And China is coming in a big way, investing. But who is benefiting from that investment? Not the people of Africa. Yes? Porcupines have uh, thorns 
at the back, which are used for defense. So the question is, how do hedgehogs or porcupines make love? The answer is, very careful. <laughs> very careful. We have to organize very carefully. We don't have to get together very carefully, especially in an environment where there's hostility from, from the official employees. Uh, but we organize, we organize with uh, a future in mind, or with a belief, a faith in your idea, in your objective. I have been in struggles of various kinds of people in my life, including um, struggling in the entire without believing in themselves, without an idea of freedom. The Eritreans were outnumbered numerically. They, did, they were not supported by any uh, body except a few wonderful people in American Europe. Whereas the other side was supported by, uh, by America at first and then by the Soviet Union. And yet the Eritreans won. Mind you, they shared their plan, but they won. Without the faith in the, in the future, in freedom, and in equality, and in self-determination of women as well as men, they would have one. What else can I say? Uh, Red, I'm in your hand. All the more questions. Ten more. You have some time. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, ten minutes. Yes. They say power tends to corrupt. All power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Bill, am I right? Uh, the Chinese are now playing a power game. They are, I think within 10, 15, 20 minutes, they're going to be the number one economy. And that was obviously very important. And they want to create a situation in which they are regarded as worthy in the world are, are, are the power. Uh, and the current leader is certainly, uh, I think, a man who believes in that. My problem with him is that now that he's a uh, more powerful emperor for life, he will make the same human mistakes that all emperors make. And believe me, I serve an emperor. I know how power can corrupt uh, a powerful man up there. So my prediction is that within five, six, seven years, there will be reaction to the monopolization of power by one man. And there will be, by the same token, also there will be reaction by Africans and others towards Chinese tendency to dominate. They dominate the, the, the African economy about even now. Why? Because Africa needs the money, the investment. And they need, of course, the energy and other resources of Africa. It's a fair exchange, fine. But I repeat, who is going to be the beneficiary of the huge Chinese investment? Not the people. That's where the problem lies. So the reaction of people, Africans and others, towards China will depend on the behavior of the Chinese, on their uh, performance in accordance with what we, as human beings, regard as core values that have come to stay. Human rights, and equality, democracy is not a European invention. It may have had its role in, in, in Europe, certainly in European history, but it's a universal human value. And the Chinese have to accept it. I believe in this like an article of faith. Okay? Otherwise, they will make mistakes, they will bump here and there, and, and then they, they will come back. Uh, they depend on the 
money power right now. They are actually space in the Americans in some parts of Africa in terms of volume investment, okay? trade investment. And that's fine, I accept that. But in exchange, there have to be certain terms and conditions which we Africans must insist upon. Yes, sir. One of the things that, that uh, characterized uh, our administration in this country, vicious attack on the press, can you comment on the role of a free press in the kind of democratization of the United States? It's critical. Erica, would you, would you summarize the question, please? Yes, yes uh, there's been a, a, a wanton attack on the press in this country. Can I summarize the role of press, uh, of the press? Absolutely. It played a, a wonderful role in Nigeria. I, I'm sure Aida here will uh, back me. The, the, the press in the Nigeria uh, played a critical role in overthrowing uh, the Abati regime, the military regime. I don't know how it is in, in, in the Congo. Uh, they have been suppressed enough. I don't, I don't think they the right, but uh, I think that uh, that's one of those uh, issues of which there could be also uh, agreements between various uh, bodies in Africa, in Europe, and America, between uh, journalists and other professionals, lawyers, and so on. Certainly, uh, freedom, freedom of the press is critical for democracy. It's critical for human rights. I repeat again, you know, uh, anybody who has power eventually tends to be corrupted in power. Power is about money or political power tends to corrupt. And there has to be uh, there have to be mechanisms and principles to offset that. I regard the constitution mechanism of the United States as men of genius. You may not agree with their philosophy, but one of the things they did was they learned from the oppression of the British. Remember there was the British monarch uh, against whom they rose. They also were men, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, wrong Bill, some of them uh, read Latin and Greek. They were learned men. I uh, read somewhere that Jefferson and Franklin read Montesquieu's work in the French original. Montesquieu's uh, uh, Separation de Pouvoir, the Press of Power, they read it in the original. And they applied it in the Constitution. I regard the Montesquieu theory as a kind of uh, laboratory invention. And the Constitution makers of America were the engineers who put it into practice. So the science of government, as we know it today, with three branches of government, uh, looking against each other, uh, uh, after each other, uh, uh, checks and balances, was institutionalized for the first time in human history in the US Constitution. And it was copied in Europe, although it was born in Europe, it was practiced in America. And it came to Africa courtesy of colonial rule. We now have governments, and that have, on the face of it anyway, three branches of government, co equal and so on. But in terms of making this in practice work, it requires time. It requires time. Two more. Two more questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your wonderful lecture and also for the wisdom of the comments in response to the questions. I'd like you to imagine an ideal organization of African unity and what would be its role in maintaining the core values? Oh. The African Union actually, uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, said the way towards greater integration in Africa is through the core values. I don't know, but it might have been the spirits of the ancestors or some angel whispered in their ears. <laughs> but they did that. They said that it's black and white. So they have rhetorically uh, 
made a commitment. It's up to us to make that commitment to work. But what should their function be? I mean, if it's up to us. Okay. The, uh, the organization of African Unity was replaced by the African Union of 10 years ago, 12 years ago now. One of the changes, I happen to be one of the drafters of the African Union Charter, so I feel guilty for its, for its witnesses. But the African Union made an improvement in terms of the possibility of intervention in the affairs of a nation in case of uh, massive human rights violations. In other words, it happened in, in, in Uganda. It happened only because they really insisted on supporting uh, the, the, the record in, in Uganda. But he was not working in accordance with the OIO Charter. So it needed the change of the Charter uh, to enable leaders uh, to hold their uh, brethren accountable. But leaders act only in, in terms of uh, in accordance with the requirements of their people. I hark again and again on the importance of people's organization. Without organization, the ideas that I'm talking about will, will, will not will fall by the wayside. That organization, and the young lady asked me about women. Well, they had recognition, they had organizations to uh, achieve some of the uh, benefits they have, they have been able to achieve. Uh, they need more organization, they need stronger organization, they revitalization of the of the organizations, and the same is true of political parties in Africa. The, the role of the youth in this respect, because they are the carriers of ideology, youth. I was you, the young ones. If you, you become crazy with the ideology, you want to uh, carry it through, even if it is facing death. That kind of idea, that kind of energy is missing. That's why I'm encouraged by what's going on in, in Florida with young kids. I suspect that this will be very copied elsewhere. Uh, the Vietnam War created opposition. It took time, but what? It, it was a groundswell of opposition. It, it, it actually made a difference in ending the war. By the same token, I think Africans African people, properly, properly organized, properly supported by like-minded people uh, uh, abroad, America, Europe, Asia, uh, they can make, make it great. But ultimately, it depends on us, on the Africans, especially the youth. I have a question. The last question. I guess that was the last question. <laughs> <laughs> As Bernard Shaw used to say, uh, the subject is not exhausted, but the, the audience is. <laughs> As we close, let me just underscore what is obvious to all of us for, and the reason why we're, we are here. It is an extraordinary privilege and honor to be able to benefit from uh, the words and the writing of an elder statesman and scholar uh, based on all that he has done uh, and witnessed in the world. So again, let me thank you not just for this wonderful book and for your wisdom you shared with us today, but for who you are and who you have been. for a book signing or yes yes oh yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. yeah there, there are books here for those who like to sign them however you grab a book will you pay for it first <laughs> <laughs> and then bring it back uh, uh, to be signed uh, so that we're square it's my credit card is back um, I also want to mention uh, Sharif the next book talk Thursday what is the date? Thursday next week. What is the date? Uh, the 8th, March 8th. March 8th.